Let me have you turn with me in your Bibles tonight to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 100, excuse me. See if you're awake. Verses 1 through 10. John 3, John 3. We're going to look at verse 1 through 10. I don't know how many times I use this as an example this week. Uh, people ask me certain questions like, oh, well, this is how I would do it. And I took this passage out and would explain things. So I decided to preach on it. And um, let me read the, the Word of God. If you would follow with me in your copy of God's Word. In the beginning was the Word. No, that's wrong. Excuse me. Search three. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is flesh, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet do not understand these things? Heavenly Father, we bow and say to you, there are things that we do not understand, but they're in your word. And we believe your word. I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts tonight, that we would have more and more confidence in you. You are the rewarder of all of ministry and life. And Father, I pray that our faith would grow. I believe our faith grows from the hearing of the words of Christ. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. When I first became a Christian in 1994... I came home for Christmas, and I've shared this a little bit one time. We were sitting around the dinner table, eating rice and probably whatever. I like rice. And my, my sister had, uh, my sister was in, let's see, my sister was in 12th grade. She was getting ready to graduate. I was a junior in college. No, no, I wasn't. I was a senior in college. Wait a minute. My sister was a freshman at college and I was a senior. See, my mind is going. (laughs) No, I was a junior in college. My, 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 My sister was a senior. I came home that Christmas. That that was it. Yeah, that's it. I remember it's 1994. Don't you remember 1994? It's getting harder to remember 1994. I think it's just yesterday, but it's what? Almost 30 years ago. It's amazing. 20 years ago? That's almost 30 years ago. Next year, it's 30. I said 1984. 
Well, I started off this really, really well. I wasn't even born yet. Now I'm really starting to feel interesting. You know, uh, you, know you, you always, you know, but anyway, no, I'm not going to go there. Anyway, shift. Okay. Well, we're sitting at the dinner table, and my sister had said, because it, one of the things that my sister's friend was going to, she had a good friend that was going to Baylor University, and you know where that is, right? That's in Waco, Texas. Waco, Texas, I'm sorry. Not Waco, Waco. Um, and, and, and Waco is, you know, uh, it's out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, it's the Baptist bubble, as they say, out there. And one of the things that uh, my sister's friend was, she, they, they, she got a dorm room. And her dorm room was with this born-again Christian. And my sister's friend, because of that, decided not to live in the dorm. Because she didn't want to be around someone who was born again. Well, my mom was... Approval. Her, my mom's approval of that was very evident. She said, that's good because you don't need to be around any of these born-again people. They're crazy. Well, about three months ago, I had been born again. So I raised my hand at the dinner table like we did. Got permission to speak. I said, Mom, I'm born again. She looked at me and she said, no, you're not. <laughs> About just like that. Well, being the um, shotgun that I was and am, and had just bought a brand new study Bible, I opened it up to John 3, verse 3, and I said, Mom, it says, unless you're born again, you're going to hell. That's what I told Mom. And we had a, my, my sister was at the dinner table, and she goes, my, aren't we a happy family? Um, but it's true. There are things that we don't understand and there are passions that the Spirit of God works in our lives. You see, the Bible says that there is something, there is, that, that salvation is supernatural. It, it is done by the Spirit of God that, in ways that we cannot explain. So I can't explain everything about how the Spirit works. Because the Spirit does what it wants to, doesn't it? Um, the Bible says in Jeremiah, Can an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopards his spots? Then also, can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil? And of course, the, the idea there is no. Not, not, not according to your flesh. And the Bible also says in Matthew chapter 19 verse 29, can a man in love with his money enter into the kingdom of God? And it says, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says, Can a natural man welcome or apprehend the things of the Spirit of God? They are foolishness to him, and he is not able to comprehend them because they are spiritually assessed. Then in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. Can the human mind, as it comes into being, grows by merely natural processes, please God? The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. John chapter 3, verse 7. Can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born when he is old? I want to ask you this. Do you feel the shock of these statements? I mean, th th these statements are really shocking. That, that fleshly people, people that apparently look alive, are really dead. Talk about mummies. Talk about... What, what are, kids don't play with mummies, do they, today? Oh, they probably do today. Um, but it's an amazing thing. And see... Because it's impossible for a man to cause himself to be born again. We can't change the color of our skin, like a leopard can't change his spots. 
A camel can't go through an eye of a needle. A natural man can't welcome spiritual things. And the mindset of a fallen person cannot please God. And man can't be born again. We think. To, to which we answer all the time, but God. God can change the colors. God can make a camel fit through an eye of a needle. God can turn a natural person into a spiritual person. And God can cause people to be born again by his Holy Spirit. But this verse, these verses should stun us. It says, no one will enter the kingdom of God unless he is born, how many times? Twice, right? Born by the power, not his own, but power of the wind, according to the wind's will. It's, it's stunning. It's like we're shipwrecked. We're, we're like a bunch of shipwrecked sailors stranded on a raft with a makeshift sail made out of our shirts utterly lost unless the wind blows. We're, we're stunned. We need to feel the plight that Nicodemus was in. I always say that Nicodemus was a man and when you, when you read the text here was a man so in that culture he he could, he could testify in the court of law. Number two, he was a Pharisee. One of the religious rulers of the day. He, he was probably part of the Sanhedrin. And so he had special religious authority over that day. He was a Pharisee. He was a man who people went to for answers and kept the law most diligently. He was also a man who was a ruler ruler of the Jews. And, and you, you ask the question, is there a difference between being a ruler and a Pharisee? Some people say no, but I believe that the ruler of the Jews is a political office and a Pharisee is a religious office. And so here is a man who is powerful, a man who is a leader. And Jesus tells us how to witness to this leader. You know what he says to do? He says that salvation for you is impossible on your own strength. You can't do it. You can't see the kingdom of God. And if you can't see the kingdom of God, you can't believe in it because you're blinded. Nicodemus was like a man in a room where all the door handles were too high for him to reach. And Jesus would say, come out if you want to see the kingdom of God. And he couldn't. Because the door handles were way up there. He's way down here. He had no ability to get up to where the door handles were. And so he says, this is the statement about the human condition. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. It says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I'd paraphrase it like this. When you are conceived, you are born by human parents and you share a human nature. When you are conceived and born by the divine spirit, you share in the divine nature. The first birth makes you alive, gives you human life. The second birth gives you spiritual life. The first birth knits our hearts affectionately to our father, our earthly father. The second birth knits our hearts to our Heavenly Father. The first birth gives us appetites for milk and other things. Now, maybe you don't like milk. I loved milk. Well, never mind. I thought of another story, but I'm not going to go there because I'll probably get it wrong tonight. But we have desires and passions because we're born of human parents. And when we're born finally of spiritual parents, we have a spiritual passion then. We're not born that way. We have no spiritual passions otherwise. The first, birth, the first birth 
gives, imparts an impulse to save our lives. The second birth imparts a supernatural impulse to lose our life for Christ's sake. But there are problems. This passage is very, it has a lot of problems. It, it's, it's not very complimentary to those who are not believers, to those who have not been born again, to those who do not see the kingdom of God. And let me give you quickly four problems I see here. Because we have to be born again, but we have to realize that this is something that is impossible for us to do. We, we don't do it ourselves. We do it and it is done because of the marvelous grace of God. That's why I think, uh, um, and now I, I forgot the name. Amazing Grace. Um, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. He said, you know, you're, you were blind. Now you see. Who caused that? It was, it's the wind. It's the Spirit of God. And the first problem is we have a problem that we are fleshly. We are fleshly. We're, we're people of the flesh. And the Bible says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh, right? This means that people by nature are merely human. They're devoid of the spirit is what that means. They're devoid of the spirit. Jude 19 says, in, it is these who set up divisions. Natural people devoid of the spirit. Flesh in John 3, 6 refers to human nature out of touch with God, devoid of the Spirit. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, Paul describes his experience of this when he says about the moral condition of human nature, he says, I know that no good thing dwells in me. That is in my, what? Flesh. The flesh is a human nature cut off from the Spirit of God. Now, I could say you that I always tell people the one way to remember with the definition of flesh is spell it backwards and cut off the, cut off the F. No. Spell it backwards and cut off the H. It means self. Self. And the self is cut off when we talk about self and selfishness and all those things, we're cut off from God. We're cut off from the all-satisfying God. And the result is no good thing dwells. It means utter corruption and depravity. In Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21 says this. Now the works of the flesh are plain. These are the works of the flesh. What do you think the works of the flesh are? Loving kindness, joy. No, the works of the flesh are these. Immorality, impurity, uh, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissensions, factitiousness, envy, drunken, carousing, and the like. Now Jesus had just and Paul just has a very low view of human nature that it exists apart from being born again. He didn't put a lot of confidence in humankind because he says that the, the works of the flesh are plain. He's speaking in general terms. He says that which of the flesh is flesh. People cut off from God. You know, it's really amazing that God in his, what we call, I call it common grace, if you know what that means, the grace that he gives to everyone and regardless if they're believing or not, he gives, he, he, he bestows grace upon everybody. And, and, with that, and, and, and people call that common because it's common to all. It's common to all. And, and, and without that, Middle River would be a sewage plant. All the cities would be because then you would have people living out lives in complete rebellion when they, when, in other words, the hand of God, we're not as bad as we could be, is what I'm trying to say. 
we're as bad off as we could be in the flesh, but we're not as bad. People in the flesh sometimes are really, really nice people. Have you ever noticed that? They, they can be really, really nice. But it doesn't mean that, that God is pleased with them. None of their works mean anything to God. The Bible says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and defiles man. For out of the heart comes evil thought, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, fault, witness, and slander. A lot of people will say, and, and to some degree I agree with this, what, what goes in comes out. You know, the, the, the computer kind of thing. And you put it in, it comes out. Put it in, it comes out. But where does it start? See, it starts in our hearts. That's right. Our hearts the Bible says are wicked. And apart from being born again by the Spirit, human nature, no matter where you find it, is totally depraved. It has no moral good in it. Now, it may have the capacity to buy groceries for someone they care about. It may have the capacity to compose great and wonderful symphonies. It may have the compassion to maneuver and, and plan a space shuttle. It may have a lot of capacities and a lot of good things, but guess what? It has no moral good in it. The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. That's a hard word. It was always hard for me to think about that. And so whatever man does, not humbly, if we don't humbly seek God for his power, all that the mind will bring us will be idolatry. In other words, I would say, a person, the best a person can do in the flesh is sin. That's the best they can do. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, every thought and every intention of man was on evil continuously. That's Genesis 6, from the beginning of time. And so we're in a dark state. We're in a, we're in a situation that we need to be born again. That's the problem of the flesh. The problem of the flesh. Second, the problem, second problem is that people of the flesh are dead. If you look at this, it says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. It implies that we're spiritually dead if we're not born of the Spirit. A spirit brings forth life. Prior to our new birth, we are spiritually lifeless. Now, the Bible teaches it wasn't always like that. Remember in Genesis chapter 2? God said he, he, he formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And it says, then God put him in a garden with every good thing. And he warned him about self-reliant rebellion. He said, if you're going to do anything, rely on me. And he said this. Put that tree in the garden. He said, in the day that you eat of this, the fruit of that tree, what does he say? You will be happy. You will die. And that's our problem. People of the flesh are, it really happened. People died. The spirit was cut off. Before the fall, man enjoyed the, the dwelling presence of the spirit of God. But after the rebellion, the spirit withdrew from man and left man in a spiritually dead condition, cut off from God with a heart of stone towards God. And ever since God has been working, God's work has been the redemption of a new humanity. And so John chapter 3 teaches us that God is gathering a new humanity by bringing people back from the spiritual, spiritual death. Unless one is born anew or born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Number third problem. Not only, not only are they of the flesh, not only are they spiritually dead, but those who are not born of the Spirit are, guess what? They will not enter the kingdom of God. I had a friend of mine, my first church, I was sitting there and, and uh, um, I just talked to him a couple weeks ago. Um, he, he, was a kind of, he was a guy that, that I would just say, 
was exci- very excitable. And he would always volunteer for everything. Volunteer for everything. And, and I got to find out that a lot of times he would volunteer for, for something but wouldn't show up. And does, does that seem to be a problem? You volunteer for something, you won't be there. So he volunteered one time to teach a youth class on Sunday morning. But for five weeks, I didn't see him. Guess who had to teach the youth class on the spur of the moment? Now, he thought I was going to be really, really angry. I said, no, just, just call me if you're having problems. Just, just call me. Just call me. But I remember one time he did show up and he was teaching. I remember he said, or, you know, he said this statement and we, we had to work through that because it wasn't really true. He said, we're all children of God in the class. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? I, I, there were people in the room that were visiting. I said, because we, we, I didn't want to just come out and tell him, uh, wrong answer. I said, the Bible says this, if you, and I remember in uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, to them, those who, to them, those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. So those who are born again, those who have life, those who have the authority of God, become children of God and enter the kingdom of heaven. Otherwise, guess what the Bible says, the wrath of God resides on them. These are terrifying words, Nicodemus. Think about Nicodemus. Put yourself in Nicodemus' shoes. Nicodemus, first of all, is coming to Jesus when? When does the text say he's coming to him? Right here. Lunchtime? Was this a lunchtime date? Was it a dinner date? It was at night. Why would someone come to Jesus at night? Did it? probably didn't want to be seen was scared because you know the Pharisees didn't want anything to do with him because they they thought he was a blasphemer and then the religious leaders didn't want anything to do with him because he claimed to be a king but he couldn't deny something he couldn't deny because I always thought it interesting let me just show you this when did Nicodemus ask his first question? It, it, let, me, let me read down to when he talks about being born again. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Any questions in that sentence? No questions. The man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do the signs, uh, the signs you do unless God is with him. There's no question in verse 2, right? Jesus answered him. I'm going, what do you mean? He hadn't asked a question. It's a, but it, doesn't it say in your Bible, Jesus answered him? Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I always thought that was strange. Why is Jesus answering him when he hadn't asked a question? Well, well when you're studying the Bible, this is what you do. You read the Bible in context. So go back with me. And look at verse um, 23. It says in verse 23, Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus did not, Jesus on his part, did not entrust himself to them. These are people that believed, but were not born again. These, they didn't believe savingly. It says, verse 22, when therefore he was raised from the dead, though, excuse me, uh, let me see here. Where did I say? But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. So he knows why Nicodemus is coming. Nicodemus wants to know and has a great struggle with how do I have that relationship with God? How do I enter the kingdom of heaven? How can I see the kingdom of heaven? Because I'm a ruler of the Pharisees. I'm a ruler of the Jews. And guess what? I have no peace. So he comes to Jesus at night. I believe that's what was going on. And so Jesus didn't need a question. 
You know, Jesus doesn't need questions. He knows what's going on in your mind. That's a scary thought. Right? He knows every thought. And Jesus t- tells him, you can't change your spots. But God can. The Spirit can. So that was a problem for him. He, they went into the kingdom of God. And finally, he tells them there was a problem with religious works. He was a teacher in Israel, it says in verse 10. What does he say? Are you a teacher in Israel and yet do not what? Understand this? See, there's a difference between religion and new life in the spirit. If, if I was going to describe, now, now in James it talks about true religion. But I'm going to talk about what we do as man. We create religion because we want a certain kind of life. We, we, want, to, we want to attempt to get to God. The problem is, there was a book called The Four Spiritual Laws. In in that little book, there's all these arrows trying to go up to God. But the problem is, none of them reach God. The arrow that connects God to man goes the other way. It comes from God down. Because religion always tries to make oneself righteous in our own eyes. It places works in our lives. And so it's possible to be religious. It's possible to be a deacon, an usher, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a seminary professor, and not be born again. Did you realize that? It's possible. People can become very, very religious. So you you have the problem of the flesh, you have the problem of death, you have the problem that we're excluded from the kingdom of God, and you have the problem of being religious. Now you might ask, why do we, why did Jesus say all this? What what do you expect and what would someone expect by telling us these things? If I am flesh, devoid of God's spirit, with no moral good, I am dead and, dead and a stone towards God. If I'm shut out from God's kingdom and my heart is so deceptive, I'll use religion to justify my deadness. What do you expect me to do? For the person who asks the question, there is great hope. For the person who becomes desperate, there's great hope. Because when we realize that we are the flesh and nothing we do pleases God, nothing we do can, can bring us up to God and all this is because we are not spiritually born again, we are desperate. He says you must be born again. He says Nicodemus, and this is a powerful man, you can't save yourself. You can't do it. He says, verse eight, what does verse eight say? The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And the Spirit's free. The Spirit goes where it wishes. It obeys its own laws. When it blows, the sailors are glad. When it doesn't, they become desperate. This shows that we are utterly at the mercy of a free and sovereign Spirit of God. And what do you expect to proclaim? I expect people to become helpless. When I preach, I want people to become completely helpless of their own strength. Where the only place they have to turn is to God. The only place they have to turn is to say, help me, God. Because the new birth is not our own doing. We don't work for it. But the brooding of the creator, the, 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 the rising from the dead to making you a new creature with a heart that trusts Jesus, you do not initiate your birth just like you don't initiate your, your um, physical birth. You don't initiate your, 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 your spiritual birth. You're like Lazarus. What did Lazarus do in John chapter 12 when he died? Did he, did he, what, what did Jesus do when he said, what did Jesus do to raise him from the dead? He said, come, what? 
come forth. It was Jesus' words that, that enlivened him by the Spirit of God to come forth. And therefore, Peter says to all Christians, he says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, you have been born again. And then he says, through, a, through the living and abiding word of God, the gospel that was preached to you. See, ever since Adam and Eve, God has been rescuing people from death. And the way that he's done it continues to be two things. The power of the Spirit and the proclamation of the Word. The power of the Spirit, the proclamation of the Word. I believe with all of my heart that our job is to proclaim the Word and trust and depend on and rely on the power of the Spirit. People talk about being filled with the Spirit today. Let me tell you, you have to be filled with the Spirit to believe. The Spirit has to be, you have to be in contact with the Spirit. And if you're devoid of the Spirit, you don't believe. But God has been rescuing people. The wind has been blowing and it is still blowing. And it blows specifically when the Word of God is preached and proclaimed. That's why you can never fail. Never. Hear me. You can never fail when you share the Word with somebody else. You can't fail. I say this, the only way you fail at witnessing is what? By failing to witness. The only way I can fail as a pastor is to not proclaim the word. You can grow a big place. You can do a lot of things. But you have, there, there, there will be no kingdom change Unless it's done by the Spirit of God through the preaching of the Word of God. It just doesn't happen. See, I think a lot of times the gospel misfires out of, a, out of mouths of weak and worldly preachers. There are worldly men that try to add their tactics and techniques to the gospel message and, and trust in them more than they trust in the power of the word. But when the Holy Spirit is upon a message, there's an explosion of life. See, I, I, I have to, I have to, my challenge, see, my challenge is every time I get up to speak, it is not because of my oratory or my ability. It is because I want to be faithful right here to proclaim to you what it says regardless of whether it makes sense, whether you like it or not. It has to be preached and proclaimed because that is what brings people to life. The power of the Spirit and the proclamation of God's Word. And so tonight, in closing, let me tell you a couple of things I want you to do. I want you to examine your own hearts. Romans, I said, chapter 8, verses 7 and 8 says this. The mind of the flesh does not submit to the law of God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit if the spirit dwells in you. So here's the test. Are you submissive to God's commands? Or are you mostly rebellious? When you read a command that God says in his word... Do you try to reinterpret it to your liking? One pastor told me, we need to interpret the Bible firstly in its plain sense, in its plain meaning. Otherwise, you know what? If we don't interpret it in its plain meaning, in its plain sense, we'll end up with nonsense because then we can't know what anything means. But are you submissive to the Spirit? Secondly, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Do you say Jesus is Lord? There are people out there today that says, Jesus doesn't have to be Lord. He just have to be your Savior. Bah! He is Lord. He is Savior. That's who He is. Is He your Lord? Romans 8, 15 and 16 says, Do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, 
but you have received the spirit of sonship. We, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Let me ask you, do you have a humble confidence in God as a father, as a loving father, that you can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Do things of the Spirit attract you? When I first became a Christian, uh, one, of the, one of the ways I, I know that there's spiritual hunger in a person is if they have a hunger for the Word. If there's a true hunger for the Word. You know, if you, if you have an appetite for reading the word, if you have an appetite for memorizing the word, if you have an appetite for, for understanding the things of the word, that means you have spiritual life. But the test is this, if you have no appetite for reading the word, if you have no appetite for praying through the word, if you have no appetite for, for looking long at the word, I would say maybe, maybe, the lack of appetite means you're not born again and finally he says brothers beloved let us love one another for love is of God and he who loves has been born of God do you really love people how about people that you don't like how about people that look funny like me uh, how about people that annoy you how about, how about people that steal from you? How about people that commit atrocities against you? Do we love people? Love is an indication of whether we've been born from above. You see, the Spirit of God is wonderful. We need to examine ourselves. But if the, let me just say this. The Spirit of God is in you as a believer. The Bible fully declares that he's going to raise you up because the Spirit of God now does not leave. You know why the Spirit doesn't leave? Because you rebel every day, don't you? I, I read somewhere that, 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 that in America, people lie about 200 times a day on average not tell the full truth not tell all the truth tell part of the truth whatever it is they lie about 200 times a day now hopefully we do better but we need that forgiveness always we need to have that hunger to, to approach God in his word and, and because we're born again we're not easy with sin we're not, we just don't let it go we don't let it fester because you know what we're really uncomfortable when we have sin so tonight what I want to do is we as we close tonight we're going to sing hymn number 294 have thine own way is that right have thine own way All right. Um, I, I want you because the spirit's going to have his way but Ask him to make you willing. Ask him to make you willing to do whatever he would ever ask you to do. He has, he has borne you from above. And let me just say that, that it's hard. Maybe some of us here are under conviction of sin that they're not believers. Maybe, maybe, maybe you tonight know that you're, that you're not born again and need to be, you, you want to be born again. One of the evidence, one of the, one of the indications you're born again is that you would have faith in God. And so I call you today to repent of your sins and to trust Christ as Lord and Savior and the treasure of your life. And start living and trusting and relying upon God in that way. Maybe some of you here need to just come up here and pray. I open the altar, I open here. We're, gonna, we're just going to sing.
I just sing long, of course, but we want to sing. And I want you to do what your business with God is tonight. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we bow down.